At this time, I would like to go ahead and ask the panelists to come on up to the to their chairs. Uh, there's no assigned seating for it, but please do come up. And who we have with, with us today is Bianca Rhodes, President and CEO of Knight Aerospace. And you may or may not know this, but was recently selected as the 2021 San Antonio Business Journal Woman of the Year Award winner. Congratulations, Bianca. <laughs> We have Carol Wong, Vice President of HR, FBD Partnership. Give the key in. We have Michael Johnson, or MJ. Uh, he's the Vice President of uh, Organization Development and Finance, Kiabasa Provision Company. Additionally, we have Mark Milton, Chief Operating Officer of Workforce Solutions Alamo, who will provide information on skills development funds, training, review employment data, and workforce resources. Our moderator for today is Bill Cox, President and CEO of Cox Manufacturing Company. Bill is a past chair of SAMA, currently serves as the SAMA Vice Chair of Programs, and is a strong proponent, proponent for apprenticeship programs. Without further ado, Bill, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate that. So let's, let's jump right in to the meet here. So we're here to, to talk about, to learn about uh, recruiting and retention, and we want to hear some success stories. So let, let's let each of our employer panelists just briefly describe some of the things that they have, have done in their environment to uh, address the challenges in retention and recruiting and engagement. We'll start with MJ. Hello, how are y'all doing today? Can you guys hear me all right? Good. All right, so the old saying is there's a war on talent, as you guys have probably heard over the last few years. Um, it's official, the war's over. Talent has won. All right. And uh, so everybody out here is probably interested on how do you recruit and how do you retain, because it's both of those things. It's not enough to just recruit, you have to keep them once you have them. Um, so when we look at recruiting and retention at Kilbasa, we noticed uh, over the last several years it kept on being a high priority topic when we were in our strategy sessions. And it's gotten to the point now with uh, wage inflation going up. Mm -hmm. And um, Nazalie's here too, she's our head recruiter. Uh, she feels a lot of the pain of trying to find a talent for our organization. And I think we've done the math, it's for every 100 applications we get maybe we can hire one person. Um, and so that's a pretty staggering statistic. And so we know it's a game of numbers. One of the things I'd point out is that this is not an HR problem, this is a company opportunity. It's gonna take everybody in your organization. How you guys treat new employees as they come in is really important. Especially in manufacturing, you can usually have these silos or these cultures where you don't trust the person that comes in until they've kind of earned the respect of the team sends the wrong message, and it's more likely you're going to lose them in the next few days than if you were to embrace them with uh, big arms. So we put a team together that was outside of just HR. It included uh, people on the production floor. It included people in QA. Uh, we tried to find people that were passionate about this uh, situation and would help us determine how we can better retain and recruit. And ultimately, we landed on kind of five big topics that we put a lot of effort, energy, and resources into. The first was around re uh, rewards and recognition. Uh, there is a common deal when you talk about engagement. You don't ever hear someone at the bar saying, my boss just appreciates me too much. Right. <laughs> and it is a practice. It is something that you've got to learn to do, and it's a culture of doing. And so we started looking at how do we implement better rewards and recognition for our team members. The second is pretty typical of HR. We looked at wage and benefits. Where do we compare at the market? It's tough, though, because the market's moving very fast, right? And so reaching out to resources, uh, and we've got some, some great opportunities here for you guys to learn more about where wages and benefits are. So we took a, took a chance on that. The third thing we looked at was around uh, turning these people's jobs into careers 
and really defining career paths at all level of our organization so that if you start as a production worker, how could you become to a machine operator, to a lead, to a supervisor? What are the things that the company finds valuable, resources, trainings, et cetera? Um, and then the fourth was about this speed to hire and onboarding. We found that it took us about 21 days from the time that we liked someone and wanted to bring them on to them actually starting the job. It's a long time, especially in a very competitive market. And so Nazalie was on that team and we've been looking at how do we address our third parties that are helping us with drug tests, background checking, et cetera. And then uh, the fifth was around um, keeping a culture pulse on the organization. And so we've actually started doing something called stay interviews where we'll randomly select people throughout the organization and we'll sit with them for about 30 minutes and ask them questions like, what's your dream? What do you look forward to when you come to work? What are things you don't look forward to? So some qualitative information. And then we throw in net promoter score as well as a quantitative side on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to uh, recommend a friend or a family to work at Kielbasa? So these are kind of the five steps that we've really started to embrace. We're about three, four months into this process. Uh, we're seeing some pretty good results, but it's a nonstop challenge. So. That's excellent. Those are some powerful nuggets. I think we could build a whole seminar around that right there, but I know Bianca's got some great things too. Bianca, take it, take it from here. Yeah, so um, everything he said, um, totally on, on spot. Um, we, we have not had that much trouble with people applying for our jobs. What we have had trouble doing is finding the right person for the right seat. So we have a philosophy that says put your... Um, Play your uh, breathing mask on first before you put it on your children. So fix yourselves first. So we want to make sure that our company is a place that people want to come work at. And so we have done all kinds of things to make sure that that happens and that we have the right environment and that that experience from the minute they contact Knight Aerospace or look at our website um, to when we decide if they're the right person for our seat, that that's our option. So we're doing everything we can to optimize that. And that means from the minute we invite them to come in, we are buttoned up. We send them um, our core values. We send them our company history. We send them the schedule, who they're going to meet with and where. And it's the first impression that they're having with our company. So uh, we want to make sure right off the top of the bat that they understand that it's a privilege to come work for us. And so we like we turn on those companies competitive juices right at the beginning, and we find that that works. And by the way, that's consistent with our core values. We want that person who's competitive and wants the job, et cetera, et cetera. So we go through a lot of that stuff. And then the same thing for onboarding. We make sure that that first uh, impression of working for us is great. We want to go home. We, our goal is that they go home and say to their spouse or the, their family or whoever, and say, that they say, wow, I just am at the right place at the right time. This is fantastic. It was a great experience today. So we like to send them their schedules. We like to make sure that the first day is going to be special. Um, you know, we treat them like they're a super important person. We only have 60 employees, so every one of them is very important to us. And then on an ongoing basis, we do from the big things to the little things. Um, we are implementing right now a phantom stock plan, so I was glad to hear that that was the topic today, too. Um, but we do lots of little things. We believe that um, attracting and retaining an employee's heart is kind of like a boyfriend. You go through the stomach, right? Um, so we do that. We, we do a lot of food at Night Aerospace. We, uh, we have fresh fruit. Um, we, it, working at Night, Night Aerospace is a full sensory experience, so we bake cookies and we pop popcorn and we want to make sure everybody's like engaged all across. We have a lot of happy hours. We do a lot of fun stuff. Um, and we make sure that people think, wow, this is like super cool. We actually have people at our happy hours telling other employees, this does not happen anywhere else. And so, you know, we do all the big things, the little things, everything in between to make sure that everybody's having a good experience when they're working for us. Well, that's interesting. So I got to ask, do, do, they, what, do you have a second shift when the happy hours are going on? <laughs> you know what? You know, one thing we had to do at our last happy hour, our happy hours were so happy uh, that they were lasting for a very long period of time. So we had to actually put an end time to it. We said, this is happy hour, not a slumber party. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that works. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's a tip you can put to use. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Bianca. 
Carol, let's hear from you. Hello. Yeah, it's on. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me today. Um, so for us, I'm sure you're all aware that today's candidate is interviewing you as much as you're interviewing the candidate, right? So I think we've all experienced that. And defining your culture can really help you attract the right talent. So it's in your best interest to attract that right talent. Um, think about all the time and effort that you spend recruiting people. You spend time finding them, you spend lots of time interviewing them with your managers, with team members, and then you spend time training them and onboarding them as well. So the investment is really huge. Um, getting the right people on the bus will really drive your business objectives. I think we've probably all heard that quote from Peter Drucker that uh, culture eats strategy for lunch. Um, we believe that's very true. Um, it's very interesting. So the interesting thing about San Antonio is that 70% of privately owned business are, of businesses in San Antonio are privately owned. So that's great news. Great news because ownership and private ownership can help really set the tone and the voice for the culture of your organization. You don't have to wait for corporate headquarters in some far-flung city to tell you what your culture is. Your ownership can get intimately involved in the process. And that's what we did. So we've been redefining our purpose, values, and core vision. We started doing that back in December with our ownership family, um, and they got together and decided that um, um, that we would redefine our values and vision and purpose. And in so doing, um, we have really set the vision, which is what we will accomplish, the purpose of how we're gonna get there, and our core values of how we expect ourselves and others to behave. So by doing that, we have a shared vision and a shared language company-wide, and it increases alignment um, amongst our employees and our man managers, which will increase the success of reaching our business objectives. So as I mentioned, attracting the right talent is extremely important. So it's not just any talent, it's the right talent. So think about that employee that isn't the right fit, and you can't really quite put your finger on it, but what happens with that employee, right? So they are disengaged, they might have performance issues, so the manager is constantly trying to figure out why they're not meeting their objectives, or what's taking so long, or there might be mistakes that they're constantly making. Um, there also might be ER issues, employee relations issues, that continue to be a problem. And so I'm particularly sensitive to that because um, we spend a ton of time in the HR team um, interviewing the manager, talking to the employee. It might also affect other team members, which will affect the engagement of the entire team, so not just that one employee. So um, we've often found that when those individuals leave the organization, somehow we're able to meet our goals and business objectives a lot faster. So um, in, engaged employees in general are happier employees. And so you might ask, what does that mean to have an engaged employee or a motivated employee as we're talking about here today? Well, what it looks like is an employee will come to work and they won't just do what's on their job description. They will seek extra effort and they will apply their talents to produce superior products and services for your customers. And in so doing, they are providing higher quality products and services that your customers greatly value. So they come back and they give you more business. And in turn, they also refer your company to other customers. And so that cycle continues and you create an organic growth um, in your business. So it's very valuable to have engaged employees. And so you may be asking yourself, well, I don't know if I have engaged employees, so how do I know that? Well, ask them. <laughs> So we actually had an engagement survey, our first ever in 25 years in business, um, this past May. And so it was a simple survey, not, not 100 questions, <laughs> just 11 questions where we asked people to give us some input. We were shocked to see that we had 85% participation rate. It's a huge number. Domestically and then internationally, we had 100%. And I joked with our head of international and said, I don't want to know what you did to get them to participate. <laughs> Hopefully nothing bad. <laughs> um, anyway, but he said, no, they were just really excited that we were asking for their input. And so they filled out the survey and they also wrote in comments in those comment sessions, sections that you and I probably disregard when we, <laughs> we are filling out surveys. But they flooded us with so many comments that um, our director of talent development, who also helped with the survey, um, Tammy Kennan, who's here to Today. She, um, she helped group the comments for us, and so we reviewed them as an executive
executive leadership team and an ownership team and decided, okay, we can't tackle 100 of these actions over the coming year with COVID and hiring challenges, et cetera, material shortages, which I'm sure many of you are experiencing. Um, so we just tackled three to five of those actions that we were gonna take in the coming year. We also had the net promoter score question on there um, that you were referring to. And so we have an actual um, number that we're tracking. So we're gonna continue doing this from year to year and we're hoping to see that number improve. It was a positive number, thank God, <laughs> right? If it was negative, that would have been tough. <laughs> but we would have climbed out of it. Um, but anyway, so the other really important part of having engaged employees is communicating with them. So you roll the survey out, and then what happens, right? You don't know. You never hear from management, that's not good. So we have a quarterly luncheon where we communicate with our employees, and so we shared the results of the survey, um, some of the comments and the action items that we were gonna tackle. So we put ourselves out there and said, we're doing this, and you hold us accountable that we're gonna improve things. Um, so I think that really also helps motivate employees. Also putting visual reminders of what your core values, vision, and purpose are throughout the facility is extremely impactful. So we have banners hanging from our production floor of our core, um, sorry, of our vision and purpose, and we have decals on the walls of our core values, and we also handed out little cards that they can put in their badges, which have both, all three, core values, vision, and purpose on them, as well as little cards that they can put at their workstations. Um, and we're thinking of new ideas. We have a t-shirt design that we're rolling out pretty soon to celebrate our 25th anniversary in October. So um, other ways that you can integrate these in, into your company are uh, through your performance management system, so through your performance evaluations. You want to make sure your core values are part of that process. And then also um, your uh, talent acquisition process too. Interview questions need to be based around your core values. So you want to be interviewing and making sure that the people that you bring in are in line with you and your core values, very important. Um, and then finally, the last thing that I would recommend is to um, train your management on the vision, purpose, and core values. We included them in the process as well when we had those core values identified, and uh, we actually asked our managers to give us their input of how they would define those values because they're going to own them in the teams. Your managers drive the business. They drive performance, so they need to be on board with you. Um, giving that common language to your managers and the employees um, will definitely increase alignment company-wide so that you can reach your business objectives. And um, finally, I just encourage you to really think about culture because it really differentiates your business. So, um, you know, I think we all struggle with thinking, you know, Toyota or some other Amazon, whatever, they're offering higher salaries, but you're unique and you should sell that, right? So you should differentiate yourselves because the people that want to partner with you are out there. You just need to find them. Yep. Very good. Thank you, Carol. Those are all, well, give them a hand. Yes. So all these things you might notice, these, all these nuggets, none of them are quick fixes. They're all, they all take time. You're not going to start something today and then reap a benefit next month. You've got to look at the long view. Um, the, the one thing I might add in here, right, it was encouraging me to act as a panelist as well, but the, the only thing I can add to what they've said is consider a apprenticeship program. Uh, we started one about 10 years ago. It's approved by the Department of Labor. There's very, very few manufacturers in our region that have made that investment. It is an investment. It's a long-term investment. Um, and it's not easy. We continue to make it, uh, improve it every year. Uh, we have a full-time person dedicated to run it. Now we have about 180 employees today. When we started it, we only had about 60 employees. So it's, but we never could have grown like we've grown without investing in that training program. So that's just one other little tidbit. Now I want to come back around to our employers, and I, I want you to tell us what's the biggest challenge you see in front of you. We'll, we'll start again with MJ. Uh, the biggest challenge outside of COVID or including COVID? We're going to ask COVID last. That'll be a separate one. <laughs> we'll take that off the table. Okay. Um, personally, the biggest challenge I see is the city's doing a really good job of uh, recruiting other businesses to come to San Antonio. 
Um, and that is really putting a big strain on the existing labor force that would apply to our manufacturing or production jobs. Um, and I think any time I go to a SAMA event or a Chamber of Commerce, it's always centered around education, education, education. We've got to figure out how to educate uh, the people of San Antonio. We've got to get them excited about manufacturing jobs and the potential career path that they could lead to. Uh, because if you heard that statistic earlier, one out of 100 applicants is what's getting accepted. And you eventually run out of applicants. And so we've got to figure out how to keep that pipeline full. Very good. Thank you, MJ. Yeah, I think we have a unique, uh, maybe not everybody thinks that, but um, our biggest challenge is the, the people down the street from us. Um, we're, we're competing with big companies that pay big, big, big bucks. Uh, they get big contracts and everybody wants to leave Knight Aerospace, go work for the big contracts, and then come back to us. And so uh, we literally had to implement a new policy that says, we're going to be Hotel California. If you leave, you can't come back. <laughs> um, and so that's what actually worked for us. Our turnover has greatly reduced. Uh, we believe strongly that starting with that interview process, if you have good managers, um, they're going to be enticed. Um, it's kind of the same reason why people don't leave companies. The number one reason is because they like their manager, or the m number one reason they leave is because they don't like their boss. And so we spend a lot of time on that. We've got to get them excited from the very beginning. Uh, we've got to share that vision. We've got to tell them where they're going. Uh, we've got to show them what the career looks like, what the opportunity looks like, what it feels like to work there every day. Um, so all of that's unique perspectives. And we do a lot of other little things to try to uh, differentiate us. We work four tens, as an example. The office works four and a half days. Um, that's different from the people down the street. We're constantly looking for other ways to make ourselves do, you know, look a little bit different and feel more like family. Um, you know, what we talk about every day is we want you to get in the car and be excited to go to work. And when you leave at the end of the day, we want you to be proud of what you did and feel like if you were there, if you were not there, it wasn't just like a big number out of a big company. We actually care. You know, we actually care that you were there and you have a very uh, concise way of knowing how your work contributes to the big picture. Because I think when they are engaged at that level, they're just going to stay. They're going to enjoy it more. Very good. Thank you. I just have to echo what MJ was saying as well. I, I agree that filling that pipeline has been really difficult. So whether trying to find the best um, way to find the resumes is tough. Um, we're constantly looking for new sourcing uh, places like uh, associations, maybe for um, uh, ASH, ASHRAE, for HVAC, uh, whatever professional associations we can partner with to post our our job um, listings on their websites. Um, also, finding temps that want to work has been a big challenge. I don't know about you guys, but we'll have temps that come in and they'll work a day and they'll say, yeah, you know, I just don't want to work this hard. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> um, so you can do your part in welcoming them, which I totally agree with you. It's very important to make them feel at home. Um, but finding the right, the right temps is very important. Um, I think if you partner with your staffing agencies, as we've done, and, and you tell them, uh, we're really looking for this person short term, or we're looking for this person short to long term, we want to convert them. Um, have, giving that input to the staffing agencies is very helpful as well. Um, and then maybe also providing or asking the staffing agency to provide a skills assessment with the resume for the individual too is extremely helpful. Very good, thank you, Carol. Okay, now for the last big question, we know COVID has been a challenge for all of us. And we'll just kind of open that up of how you've been navigating those waters. Whoever wants to speak to that. MJ, you, you got something to say about that? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> um, COVID is, is obviously an interesting subject. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. Um, we've, when it came about 18 months ago, we were very fortunate that we were quick to respond with the COVID task force internally. Um, and what people don't realize is how much pressure COVID put on your IT teams, your HR teams. Um, and I don't think anybody appreciates that. Mm. <laughs> we got one guy. That's good. 
And so, but it's, it's true because we all had to pivot in a very different way very quickly. Um, and so we've, we've tried to do things like implementing pride pay, which we gave more money per hour while they were required to be on campus. Uh, we did lunches. Um, and those things have kind of continued, but eventually you got to get back to a new normal. And that's what we're trying to figure out now. And this thing continues to move up and down. And so just when you think you've got your footing again, it knocks you out. So I think long term for us, it's about how do we adopt a, uh, a work environment that's very um, lenient to working at home versus in person. Again, we do have uh, ne necessary jobs that you got to show up. Someone's got to press the button. Right. And so how do we adopt that policy where we got some leniency and work from home to being there and making a culture that accepts that and kind of celebrates it? Uh, as far as uh, COVID's impact on our general team, though, uh, keeping them safe is our number one priority. And the COVID task force still exists. The really tough thing that's also there is you never know what data to believe in. Um, we're very fortunate that the COVID cases that we've had for the most part, we believe have come from the outside. Uh, so we do believe kind of our policies have been in flux and, and been working. But uh, I'd say we're far from out of the woods on understanding this, as you guys can see in the news. Uh, some companies aren't impacted as much as others. And so it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we were not as affected as a lot of companies. Um, a lot of my peer companies, it's just amazing how bad it was. We were fortunate that we moved over into our new building right before COVID hit. So we had a ton of space and we used that uh, very diligently. We, I think the big thing for us was to communicate, to take that as an opportunity to once again make sure that our employees knew that they were being cared for, that their families were being thought of and cared for, not just them. Um, so we did, you know, we took all the regular precautions inside uh, the building and it all seemed to work, you know, just like uh, Kiabasa, we did not have any contaminations within the building. So we, we were very, very happy about that. I think the biggest issue was uh, making sure that employees knew that we were thinking about it and trying to address this thing as it changed almost daily. You know, new policies, new this, new that, and they just needed to know that somebody was in charge and that we were looking at that stuff, we were thinking about it, we were doing the best that we can, uh, and we had their best interests in mind. And I think uh, that really worked for us. I think the bigger, you know, on a broader scale, I think the bigger issues we've had is with the supply chain. Um, that's been a, a, a killer from a manufacturer standpoint. We did not stop working. Uh, we had a couple of programs on the floor that were um, government related. So we were uh, essential and we did not, um, you know, we didn't close the doors. We didn't have people work from home. And so I think in a lot of ways, you know, our new normal was same old, same old, which helped us tremendously. Very good, thank you. Carol, did you have some there? <laughs> I want to look at our time. Are we running over? We're good. Okay, no. we're good. Okay. Um, I think also managing quarantines is probably something that we all struggle with too, especially if you're in manufacturing. So it's really forced us to cross train in our teams, uh, which isn't a bad thing, whether it's COVID or not. It's always great to have a backup and have a succession plan. So it's really forced us to look at that. Um, in terms of employee relations issues, of course, I'm in HR, so I always talk about that. <laughs> um, but also, you, you have to recognize there's polarizing views of the vaccine, right, by your employee base. Um, and that's really tough to, to navigate. We have to extend a lot of grace there, but we also have to um, have policies and procedures in place as well. What we've done is um, we offered employees to come to HR, uh, show us their vaccine card, and if they, if they are vaccinated, we give them a green dot to put on their badge. Um, and they don't have to wear their mask at work. Um, if they don't have a vaccine card, or if they, um, um, if they are not willing to share it, then they have to wear their mask at work. So that's kind of how we're navigating it. Of course, if they have a vac vaccination card and they want to wear their mask, we're fine with that too. <laughs> so um, we just we try to be uh, meet people halfway with that, partway. Um, but those are my two points that I had. Very good. And I'll just check in just to, to give you a little balance. And I know we, we want to hear from Mark here, but 
and, and our company, we've done a couple of unusual things. One is that uh, we had previously always done uh, a biometric screening for blood work with our staff. So we'd get cholesterol levels, HDL and LDL levels and, and all that stuff, but we never did the uh, vitamin D. So we, of course, vitamin D is linked to ho uh, the cases that people get hospitalized with COVID. So we added that to the uh, biometric screening, and it's optional. We had about 85% of our employees participate, and of the 85%, about 80% of them were low on vitamin D, which is a national epidemic, actually, and especially in manufacturing. And in, in our region, I've learned a lot about this in the last few months, but it, 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 you really can't get vitamin D at this time of year except between about 9.30 and 5.30. And so when do our people get, get out and get sun without a supplement or something? Anyway, so we, we got that out there, and, and gave our people the results. Another little tidbit, we found that there was a rapid antigen test available, fairly inexpensive, and so we keep them on hand, and there's starting to be a shortage of them, but we do have them on hand where if someone feels funny at all, can I tell him, Ray? So Ray was feeling funny last week, and I said, Ray, we'll just get one of our tests, because he was going to wait two or three days for the darn clinic to give him his results. And then 20 minutes, you know, and I can tell you're feeling good today anyway. So it was just a job. It was, yeah. <laughs> just needed the time off. But anyway, it's great to have that test. We, we had someone just a couple of weeks ago, they were feeling fine at work, um, and they, they went home that evening, they started feeling funny, and they, they had the test at home with them, and they took it, and bingo, they were positive, and so they knew not to come in. And uh, so we caught it right away. So it's, it, that test has proven pretty darn good. They are available at, at Walgreens, but they, they come in a package of two, and they don't want to sell you more than one package. Walmart has them, but they, they sell out. So they're, anyway, I, I think that's a, we've been able to buy batches, but now my supplier is sold out. So that's a little tidbit, tidbit to pass on. That's real quick. The, on the, the vaccine mandate, we sent out a notice that we will not be mandating it. And I got a lot of accolades for that because we, number one, we believe in personal freedom. Number two, there really is a lot of uh, uh, diverse opinions in the medical community, even though a lot of them are hesitant to voice it. My personal doctor has said that he doesn't recommend the vaccine for someone 21 years or younger. And the uh, inventor of the vaccine, Robert, uh, Mullen actually has said that he believes the, uh, the, the risk of a vaccine, which it's still an experimental vaccine, is, is greater than the risk of a young person getting COVID. That's what Robert Malone says. And so he says 30, 35 or younger might not want to get it. The older people, yeah, you should get it. That's what he says. So there's, there's differing opinions. And then the other thing with the mandate, the other problem with the mandate is it ignores the value of, of the antigens that you get when you get COVID. And, and in Europe, they are recognizing that there's a type of passport people can get. So I, I, that's a very polarized, hot topic, but as an employer, we want to recognize people's freedom. So that's, that's what we're doing. Now, I've taken a lot of time. Mark, let's hear about what y'all are doing in the workforce development in San Antonio. You bet. Sure will. Thank you for that. Uh, I thought I was just going to sit up here and listen to the questions, but I guess <laughs> oh. I went out the window. Um, now, I wanted to share some information about the state of the workforce and kind of a, a 30,000 foot view of what we see today and how we could potentially be a resource for you all. So, the good news is that our unemployment rate in San Antonio is actually at 5.4% now, which nowhere near our pre-pandemic levels when we were under 3%, but we're trending definitely in the right direction. So we're very excited about that. Uh, San Antonio is actually ranked eighth in the nation for unemployment rate. So we're moving in the right, and second in the state of Texas behind our friends in Austin, but we're a little bigger than them. So we'll take credit for that as well. Um, so we're moving in the right direction. Uh, we're seeing more and more individuals become re-engaged into the workforce system. A lot of the benefits and incentives to not go to work are going away. Uh, we believe this is going to have a great impact on that infusion of individuals coming back into the system. 
so for example, if you may not be aware, but unemployment insurance extended benefits actually ended this month. Uh, so those individuals who were receiving extended UI are no longer eligible for those benefits. And we think this is gonna have a great impact. We've had over 300,000 individuals lose their jobs in a period of six months, uh, which is obviously unprecedented. But as they return to the workforce, we want to make sure that we see manufacturing as an ideal opportunity for them. Uh, and I believe there's some information that will be, be shared on the slides of what that looks like. I heard a lot of great information uh, about the overall industry and the sector and how you can have benefit. But one of the key elements for the manufacturing is that a lot of the individuals who come to the system don't exactly know what that means. What is a manufacturing job? What will I be doing? How can I advance within that particular sector? Part of our role at Workforce Solutions is to be that resource to recruit for you and to engage those individuals and ensure that they see your industry as a viable option. Uh, there's the slide we were talking about there. So basically what we do is we, uh, we want to show those individuals what the pathway looks like for this particular sector. Healthcare, for example, may be a little bit in front of manufacturing right now because it's a very seamless career ladder. You know, you start out as a nursing assistant or a home health aide, you advance to a medical assistant and then an LVN, RN, and so forth and so on. Manufacturing is not that well defined. So part of our role is to educate these individuals as they come in of what those opportunities look like and the associated wages. The more information that you can provide to us, we, we actually take this information from what you report on your unemployment statistics. So as you report to um, the state of Texas, the amount of wages that you pay on an annual basis, this is where we receive that data. So we're really trying to show that progression of how you can start out. $15 an hour range is what we see as entry level, but the advancement opportunities are definitely there. They're just not as well defined as some of the other areas, and that's where we would like to help. So the more information that we can glean from you all as to what those advancement opportunities look like, the more success we're gonna have in transitioning those new workers into your industry. So for example, if you worked in hospitality and you're looking to get out of that industry, you don't wanna do it anymore, we wanna see manufacturing as that next option for those individuals, and defining that pathway will be critical for us to do that. You can see under here the progression starting out in that 1256 range, but it goes all the way up to over $55 per hour. Uh, the public isn't aware of this. They don't understand what that looks like. They don't understand the timing it takes to transition amongst those different occupations, but that's our role and that's where we're trying to help you. Um, so what we would like to do is be a resource for you all. I think the key for us is to understand more about your industry and your sector and how we can see these individuals transition. Um, we're actually moving to a sector-based model. So the workforce system in, in this region is, is pretty large. Uh, there's a lot of different locations. We are in 13 different counties and we have over 15 different career centers where individuals may come to us. But we're really trying to streamline that for employers. So if you're interested in working with Workforce Solutions, we'll put you into contact. <laughs> I guess I got the hook on that one. <laughs> so, as I was saying, if you're interested in working with Workforce Solutions, you'd be assigned one representative that you all would work with, who would be your particular expert, your subject matter expert, in how we can transition more individuals into your, to your actual career field. Uh, the key aspect of our services is that they are free, so um, your, your taxes that you pay uh, are how these programs are funded, so we're there to support on a, on a tax-free system, uh, and we ensure that we provide you with quality candidates throughout the process. So I think the, the overall message is the state of our workforce is really improving. It's looking much better in San Antonio, but we could really help to fill those entry level and beyond positions for you as you work with us. Very good, thank you, Mark. I think we've got time for just a couple of quick questions. Who would have a, does anyone have a question, or who would have a question for Mark or one of our pan, other Bill, is it, I'm, I'm sorry, Bill, if I may, just wanna, if you can, I'm all back in the back, I had to get my microphone <laughs> working here, sorry about that. I, this is such a very important topic that I would say that we probably got about, we can, we can probably go over about five more minutes, or 10 more minutes, uh, 10, uh, 
I guess the reception I've got. But anyway, um, so if, if those, we're going to go past 1 o'clock, but those that need to go, we completely understand. And if, if you need to go because of work, uh, please do go ahead and go. I ask you to do it quietly. But if for the questions, we do have some questions here. But if anybody's got a question, let me know, and I'll bring my microphone to you to ask a question. If that's okay. And, and if you do have to leave, don't forget, leave your name tag behind. We, we do recycle those. And who's got a question here? So one in the back there, Ray. Uh, maybe everybody's visited this, but Bill, you could identify 20 to 25 years ago, you could identify as an owner as opposed to managers. It used to be standard operating procedure that one of the recruitment tools was the benefits that, that when you came in the door, don't get scared, you would get full benefits with that company. You would get 401k in some places, 100% matched, 50% match, and then slowly that pulled away because of expenses. Uh, and some don't even offer the benefits anymore or 401k. Is anyone revisiting that as a possible recruitment tool during this time when, when the competition is so tough? I'm happy to hear from the panelists, but it, what we have seen is the highest turnover is in the first 90 days. So that, I would argue, is the real reason why we don't offer that from day one is because of the excess paperwork and burden. So with the rest of the panelists, I see heads shaking. <laughs> is there anyone considering that? No. <laughs> Good question, though. What, what else? Oh, well, let me get over here, Bill, real quick. Hi, I think it was MJ or maybe Blanca describing your um, onboarding with your employees. Do you have a different strategy with your temp, if you either of you are hiring temporary employees right now, versus those that are hired full time? From a training perspective. <laughs> it's funny how that keeps working out. <laughs> we, we are currently not hiring temps. Um, we have found uh, the quality of the temporary staff has really gone down. Um, and you heard a lot about culture and values here. And Kilboss is no different. We're a values-based leadership company. And so um, we have not been going with temps. We'd rather be short-staffed, honestly than to deal with some of the burdens we've been going through. And then to address the comment uh, back there earlier, we are right now 100% benefits on day one. Uh, we've been that way. Uh, we've got a pretty extensive hiring process, and we felt good about it. But as of recently, we were just talking about there are uh, team members that are coming in and taking advantage of that. Um, I always try to steer away from making policy on the 2% of people that are going to break the rules anyways. But this is one we are strongly considering looking at. So, so you're thinking about reversing it is what I'm hearing. Wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, we do hire um, temps, and we use that as a process to get through the honeymoon period. Uh, we work very closely with our agency, so they know exactly who we're looking at, um, and we're very, very careful about it. It's not 100% successful, but we do like having that period of time to see how that person's going to acclimate and fit in. Um, with respect to benefits, we don't offer them in the first 90 days for exactly the reasons Bill said. We just found that that's where you have a whole lot of turnover. Now, we're not experiencing that as much anymore because we have improved our recruiting and onboarding process so much. Um, but I still think that you need some period of time to let the dust settle and um, and so we are we are doing that, and I I believe in not giving it all away on day one. So I like to I like to have opportunities for surprises and increases and bonuses and stuff, at, you know. So I don't like to do it all up front. I like to have you know opportunities to do more, especially that first year to really engage them and make them excited about where they the decision they made. Yeah, I'm curious how y'all feel about the city's ready to work program and I guess train for jobs this first year. And just curious if you think there's any opportunities to, you know, help y'all fill jobs that you may have open or just if that's anything you're, keep, uh, you know, thinking about engaging with. <laughs> so, yeah, we have we have played with that a little bit. Um, I think it does lead to some opportunity. You know, you have got to try everything. We, we hired interns this summer. 
Uh, it was a great program for us. We ended up converting one of them. Uh, not only did we convert him to a you know full-time employee who's on a career track now, um, but we got him to change his mind about what he was going to do. So now he's going to become a mechanical engineer, and that was nowhere in the cards for him. He hadn't even thought about that. So we're super proud of that. So yeah, I love embracing these programs. Workforce Solutions has has had some great COVID-related programs that we've taken advantage of, and I think it does open a lot of doors and make you more available to a wider array of employees or potential employees. So for the Workforce Solutions, the programs we saw with Train for Jobs, most of those individuals did pursue classroom training opportunities, which we promoted. But it goes back to the point of when, when a client comes in and they're interested in finding a new job, they don't necessarily know enough about the manufacturing industry of what those jobs look like to say, yes, I want to be trained to be in this logistics type field. So that's part of the education that we're focused on. And it, it takes a partnership. We, we cannot do that alone. We, we look at where the jobs are, but to have an understanding of what that pathway is to those actual jobs is the critical aspect of it. Oh, one more question over here, hold on. I'm Mike McIver, the Pressure Systems International Manufacturing Guy, and as you guys know, in about two and a half weeks, we're going to be teaching the leadership program. And that was my first question was in two parts to the panel, which you did awesome. That was very, very good stuff, and I think there's a lot of plenty of gold nuggets we can take from that. But when we talk about motivation and maintaining, our problems are those first-tier supervisors that we put in position. Usually we put them in that position because they're very good at what they do. So boom, you're now a leader. And maybe they're not quite prepared for that. So my question was to the panel themselves, what are you doing? And let me back up and let me ask you a question. How many of you guys fly coach and would not mind being flown first class? You know, they say, hey, Bill, we'd like you to fly first class. Would you like to do that today? How many of you guys would take that opportunity to fly first class, right? How many of you guys would take the opportunity to take your crappy i6 cell phone and your boss says, I'm going to give you an i12. How many of you guys would do that? Right? Really? That's it? I think everybody appreciates an upgrade, but we never take the time to upgrade ourselves. You know what I'm saying? I don't have time. I'm manufacturing. Don't have the time to do that. Can't go to that class. So my first question to the panel is, what do you do to upgrade yourself? And I hope whatever you do, you share that with your peers below you. And then if you want to upgrade your supervisors, next two and a half weeks, we have the leadership seminar. Perfect time for them. It's not really to make them a supervisor, it's just really to help them with a couple more tools to enhance their current position as a leader. All right, so look, look into that. Thank you. I, I think I can answer for the panelists. They're either going to join our HR, SAMA HR peer group, or they're going to send someone to represent their company to join. <laughs> <laughs> I'm part of the operations peer group, and you guys that are part of the CEO peer group, is what it's really about is sharing ideas with peers. So once again, this class that we're going to be offering for them to come in that opportunity and talk about their bosses, you know, because we put some, we put some pretty big demands on them. When I hear about the surveys and stuff, I'm like, oh my gosh, this poor first line supervisor, I bet they got crucified. <laughs> John doesn't do this, and treats me like that, and that sort of. So once again, I'm not beating the horse, but. Uh, well, good point, and, and and we are right at the 10 minute mark that Ray was giving us extra leeway on, but let me make a final plug for that HR peer group. The one thing I, two things I don't think we mentioned, one is the cost is only $1,200 annually, so compared to other peer groups, it's very, very low cost, and I have to say, personally, I've been in at least one peer group continually, everywhere from all day to half a day. This is only going to be a couple hours a month. Um, but it, nothing has helped me more professionally, to Mike's point, that better than being in a peer group. And th this peer group, we hadn't mentioned, is going to be led by an HR professional uh, fr from RSM, uh, a 20-year Cindy Mergle. Mergle. Cindy Mergle, and she's a real pro, and so you're going to have a subject matter expert there at the table. And she's not there to be to answer everyone's questions, but to question the answers more than anything and to share and collaborate. So I thank you panelists for taking your time out of your busy week, especially this week.